queen. Oh wow, there's a lot of people here. There's a lot of people here. They came to see you, and you uh, have earned. Oh and Lord, I hope I hope you're ready. All of it. Oh, we're getting into it today, y'all. This is a fantastic uh, work, and I'm so glad that you have made it. First of all, period. I'm glad that you have made it because you've been <laughs> working so hard on doing so many of these great things. I want to ask you why you decided to uh, to compile all of this as a graphic novel. So, preliminary backstory, I should admit right now that I actually, when, when I pitched this book, I didn't expect the pitch to be accepted. You can all laugh at me, okay? <laughs> I turned in a four-page pitch, and I thought, they're never going to do it, right? But if I were a 12-year-old, <laughs> this is the book I would have wanted to read. Fun fact, I didn't like history until I was in college. If you had asked me between 12 and 25, <laughs> I would have kind of shrugged at you and be like, some of it's interesting, but history is really boring. Over the years, I've since figured out that the way that we teach kindergarten through 12th grade history is the least interesting, least engaging, and in some ways, least informative way for many people. For some people, they can wade through the fact that they have to learn that the Battle of Hastings was in 1066. Do you remember why the Battle of Hastings matters? I don't. I wasn't aware that there were years before 1200. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right? And so I would have wanted a book like this, is, is the, the, the short version of a much longer answer. The other part was that when I first started to like history, I realized I didn't know any history. Everything I thought I knew was wrong, right? And it wasn't just US history. What I thought of as world history was actually just Europe, mostly British, yeah, a little French sprinkled in. Yeah, Western European history. Right, yeah. and I thought, you know what would be really cool? If I, could, if I could write the book that I really wish I had, could have had. And so when I pitched it to 10 Speed, in the back of my head, those of you who are writers already know that you don't really believe anyone's gonna buy the thing that you're sending them, right? <laughs> like you don't, you don't believe it. But also you're like, well, sent that in. So <laughs> Caitlin, my editor at 10 Speed, responded actually really quickly and said, we would love it, and then we started planning. Fun other fact, Caitlin assumed that I had an entire plan, that I had a team, I knew what I was gonna do. I am certain there are writers out there in graphic novels who work that way. I don't know any, but one probably exists, right? And the one that exists lays everything out in advance. I sent a flurry of emails. <laughs> Um, one to Astor D'Amico, who is not here, unfortunately, because of flu, but who is the amazing illustrator that makes this book look as pretty as it does, and said, hey, do you want to do this thing? And Astor said, sure. Sounds fun. I think Astor changed their mind 20 or so times sure, that's, during the process. That's a designer's prerogative. Right. But didn't tell me no. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't tell me no, well, we're going to keep going. Um, and so we wanted, as we talked about it, we wanted it to be a book that people would want to go back to, that they would not just read the first time, but would think of as something they enjoyed reading, right? It's, it's one thing to say, well, I'm going to pack all these facts in here. It's something else to say, you're going to want to read this book again and again. And I don't know if we pulled off the second part of that goal, but so far, I've had several, I bought this book for me and my kids stole it, and I will totally take that. I will totally accept <laughs> the fact that your fifth grader has just jacked my book out of your bag and is like, yeah, this isn't yours anymore, mommy. <laughs> well, you've been getting uh, some great response since the, the book dropped publicly. Uh, people have been tweeting you and sending Instagram photos of their classrooms full of, of children, of their, their own offspring just like yoinking this book out of their possession. And I, I have to imagine that when you, when you set your sights on writing a graphic novel that you've got to expect that there's gonna be some, uh, there's gonna be you know, quite a bit of, of young people interest. Uh, but did you think it was gonna be the kind of thing that was gonna be an intergenerational teaching moment? I hoped it would be a book for all ages. One of the things we tried to do was make the colors really pretty. Um, Sherry, who is our colorist, and there's a whole story about the first colorist that I won't get into, but uh, <laughs> our second colorist, um, who is amazing and frankly deserves 87 awards for the speed in which this happened, 
Sherry said, well, how bright, how colorful? And we said we want it to be full color, just as much visually engaging detail, right? Because I figured if nothing else, for people who aren't good readers, right? The average American reads between a seventh and 10th grade level. And even if you are not necessarily going to be able, so some of the fourth and fifth graders I've seen might be struggling with some of the words. Not a lot, I tried to write. But you know, there's some concepts they might need a little help with. I wanted it to be something that when they looked at it, they could get context clues from the art. And the easiest way to get context clues from art is if you like looking at it. Anyone who's ever picked up a comic book and said, this looks like Captain America is a pile of canned hams. And some <laughs> of you know who I'm talking about. Um, and then you put the book back down, right? Because you didn't like looking at the art. Yeah. That is something that we wanted to avoid. We wanted to make it so that kids would want to look at it, adults would want to look at it. We weren't sure kids were going to read it as, well, as aggressively as some of them are. I've had a couple of parents tell me, like, yeah, I can't touch my own book. <laughs> Sorry, you got to get two. You got to get two now. <laughs> yeah, one, one, one of my friends did. She said, I'm just going to go buy myself another copy because I don't think I'm getting that one back. Well, let's dive into some of this artwork that is accompanying uh, this great history lesson. Uh, let's start with uh, pages 26 and 27. This is an epic scene. This is all of the characters. Uh, can we can we throw that yeah. one up here? I will. I was like, yay. yay! Oh wait, no. This Those is 22 and 23. We'll go. Here we are. This okay. is what I'm talking about. This is what s the last season of Game of Thrones should have looked like. <laughs> There's not a single brand anywhere not doing anything. So uh, there's some treats here in this graphic, which I really enjoy. Uh, if, if you're familiar with the concept of Easter eggs, it's uh, Easter eggs are, are things that are just a little reward for you for paying extra attention. And uh, this comes after when we are introduced to the group of students who want to learn more about yes. the history of women and feminism, and their teacher, who has the, the word bubble here. Uh, tell us a little bit about what's going on here in this slide called Amazons, Valkyries, and Other Warrior Women. So one of the fun things for me has been learning that the Amazons were real. That they're there real. Was, they're real. I, I love that so much, because right. folks might just think it's Wonder Woman and Xena, and that's all. And so this is the thing. <laughs> For a long time, the women who we, we th would think of, I'm going to say this wrong, and you can totally make fun of me, but that's fine. I want to say it's pronounced Saramushans. Um, their graves were originally classified as being that of a group of warrior men. It wasn't that we didn't know wh where the Amazons had lived. It wasn't that we didn't have evidence. It was that they decided that all of these bodies buried with these weapons in what was clearly elaborate funeral rites for warriors were men. That's why you think the Amazons are a myth, right? There's actually more than one category of Amazons, which the book gets into later. And so I thought it was really interesting to learn how many times throughout history women fought, especially because when we got to Valkyries, how many of you think that the Vikings set sail on ships full of men, that no women ever left? You, my friends, are wrong. They were called shield maidens, and they fought young women who didn't have property or who just wanted to, apparently, went out and they fought. And it's not that you have a reason to know that you're wrong, because for a long time, again, their bodies were labeled as belonging to men because they had weapons. That it was the entire reason they were assumed to be men was the weapons. There was no biological. There was no, there was, first of all, the anthropologists didn't even look at pelvises. Oh. And so for those of you who know anything about bones, <laughs> their pelvises gave it away, right? There's a slight difference in shape, right? What we used to call birthing hips in some, some communities and still do. <laughs> um, so these were bodies, lots of them, again, where she was armed. We, we found graves of women who clearly died in battle. Right? There's a, an image circulating, a recent find, a relatively recent find, where you can see in the reconstruction the axe or sword hit through the front of her face. Right? And it's gory, but also it tells you that women in the ancient world weren't actually sitting around. And even 
when they were quote unquote sitting around, those cave paintings we all hear about and, and saw pictures of, women painted those. those. Those early Venuses, those robust statues that look like a pregnant person's body, like it just seems the dimensions are very exaggerated. And you think, well, who looked like this? You know what that view looks like? When you look down yourself. If you look at them from above, right? That's the way your body would look to you, especially while you're pregnant. And so a lot of things that were assigned and that you probably grew up and that you learned K through 12 and maybe even in early college, depending upon where you went to school, um, where men's work were really a much more egalitarian society than we think. Yes, yes, hunter-gatherers, fun fact, hunters needed gatherers to not starve, right? Sure, the meat was good, the protein was good, but you also needed other things to go with the meat, and somebody had to dress it, and somebody had to make sure that there was a way to cook it, and so forth, so on. My doctor keeps telling me about vegetables, and I'm just like, sure. A smoothie, <laughs> a smoothie, a, smoothie. <laughs> a salad. Listen, we're gonna, I'm gonna convert her. <laughs> I love that this book dives into a place uh, where the folks that we're talking to are highly curious, uh, very smart middle schoolers. So we're talking to folks in this book who have a desire to know about the history of, of these women, of these warriors, of, of these, these underrepresented people. And I think that's, we're, we're all of these middle schoolers, right? Like we are, if we're cracking this book open, that means that we have a desire to learn more. Why was it important to you to start at that base and not at some place, you know, more elementary, more rudimentary? Well, most kids read up. Okay, so when we're talking about Lexile scores and all of these other things that your kid's teacher may say to you and you may be like, what does this mean? Because it's not what we did. Um, the reality is that except for very early readers, how many of you remember the beginning of the Harry Potter series? Right? Do you remember the kids that were actually reading Harry Potter at first and how many of them were actually 10 or 11 years old and the book was supposed to be, the series is supposed to be for older children? I was not a person who read the books I was supposed to read after, I don't know, kindergarten, possibly not before. Um, and I don't know many kids who are readers who read at their expected grade level, right? I know a lot of kids, at least kids who love reading, nobody liked Dick and Jane. No one. <laughs> Dick and Jane didn't like Dick and Jane, right? <laughs> and so when you think back to, say, let's go with third grade, and I was an ill-raised, sneaky child, so I was trying to break into the Stephen King in third grade, right? <laughs> By fifth grade, everybody in my house had just given up. They were like, okay, I don't know what she's reading. I'm not going to ask anymore. But think about a kid who's really curious, who really likes to read, and how long it takes them from the point where they like reading to the point where they start to jump ahead, right? And I know someone's going to be like, but it's a graphic novel, and it should be a regular book. And I'm going to tell you that graphic novels are both informative and educational, and also, frankly, more fun to read. And the more fun it is to read, the more likely your kid is, or you are, to keep to read it, right? I was someone who, even though I read Stephen King and a bunch of other stuff, I ate comic books for breakfast. Oh, yeah. Right? And when I was a kid, we had, well, maybe before I was a kid, but in my house, there were comic book versions of all sorts of classic novels, you know, the, uh, Moby Dick or uh, any number of Edgar Allan Poe things. And if there hadn't been pictures there, I don't know that I would have picked up those books. I, I'm going to admit now that I like the kids' version of Moby Dick, but when I had to actually read <laughs> Moby Dick, I'm still holding a grudge. That book could have been 300 pages shorter. Ooh. I know somebody's going to be like, but it's a classic, and I'm going to be like, but it's boring. I also feel that way about other things where we get really into the description, and it's pages and pages. Tolkien does this, where it's pages and pages of the description of the Rolling Hills. Just draw a picture. Save us all. Well, you've drawn plenty of pictures here. Uh, a. D'Amico has drawn plenty of pictures here. Yeah, I, was like, I don't draw. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I know. Credit where credit is due. Don't look at me. And we take a, a good look at a lot of, of figures that 
we've learned about in, in our uh, elementary, high school, and you know, uh, college education. But there's a lot of names here that I had never heard before, and I was just like, oh my god, can I get a t-shirt of this person? Can I get a Halloween costume of this woman? Let's talk about Irene, Empress Irene, from the Byzantine Empire. First of all, let's, let's look at this graphic that is serving stained glass realness. I love it so much. This is such a great illustration. But what do we need to know about the Byzantine Empire and why Irene was so important here? So one of the weird and interesting things is that when we were talking about the fall of Rome, we're actually only talking about half of Rome falling, Western Rome falls. Eastern Rome, which eventually becomes Constantinople and other things, doesn't fall. Irene holds it together, OK? And she would have been amazing in the sense that she was effective, she was ruthless. Side note, I'm not going to tell you all of these women were kind or nice or no, any of the other things. They did what they had to do. Right, women who held power were often just as vicious or more so because they had to be. But, um, and I'm turning around, even though I don't need to turn around, habits, habits, habits. Um, but one of the things was that there were certain fights Irene knew they could not win. They didn't have the forces. They weren't going to be able to, to fight the fight. And the men that were beneath her insisted on fighting this fight. Eventually, she's deposed and forced into retirement. King Nikephorus puts himself on the throne for a brief moment. Oh, it's very brief. Right. <laughs> and then he goes to war with the Bulgarians she told them they couldn't defeat. The man that killed him kept his skull as a drinking cup. So, so listen to women, I guess, yes. is the <laughs> lest you get your skull used as a coffee mug. Cheers to that. <laughs> uh, she reunited churches. Uh, mm -hmm. And back then, that was in the plus column for, Except. for women. Except that churches historically have not always been the best friend of gender equality. No, and it was very interesting because she hadn't done anything I mean, he crowns the, the Pope crowns Charlemagne. He counts her throne as empty and crowns Charlemagne. But there wasn't really a good reason to count her throne as empty. Or as though she'd done anything worse than Charlemagne except not be in a masculine frame. That's basically what I got. I never could figure out the logic on she's united the churches, she's done all of, brought in all of these tax revenues and kept, kept the, the empire from falling. What we should do is replace her with an idiot who gets himself perished. I mean, Not good politics. Misogyny, we, misogyny kills. Misogyny is, is a real thing. I think that we, as a 21st century society, could maybe learn some of these lessons so we don't repeat them, but we're not. OK. <laughs> Let's take a look at Queen Nanny of the Maroons. Uh, first of all, this, this graphic, uh, these graphics tell so much. There's so much emotion in her face. There's so much uh, stoicism in her face. And those are great qualities for a leader, especially at her level. But before we get into the things that Queen Nanny did, tell me about the term maroon. What does that refer to? So maroons, and there were actually a couple of different versions of this, but it boiled down to groups of slaves and indigenous people, well, slaves, and former slaves, because they had freed themselves and joined with indigenous people and, and formed communities. And the Maroons were, for our purposes these days, re rebels. They refused to be held in bondage. They worked together with the indigenous population who was also fighting the oppressive nature of colonialism and imperialism. And they wanted freedom. And they saw no reason I know we love a, a good like postscript of nonviolent acceptance, and <laughs> somebody gave them rights for asking. They saw no reason not to fight back. So they did fight. They fought for their freedom. They fought for the freedom of others. They established communities and forced colonial governors and so many. I'm sorry, I'm just laughing, thinking about some of the things that I read. How many times they would say, oh, well, it's only a handful of them. We can definitely defeat them. Fun fact. British soldiers didn't understand guerrilla warfare, not even a little bit. Those red coats and even the raggedy white underneath, if you wear these things in the jungle, do you know what happens? <laughs> I'm just saying. 
<laughs> Just the thought. It's the opposite of camouflage. It might maybe put a target on you. Maybe. I mean, I, I know what I know about animals and bright colors, and that's not a good thing. Right. That's, that's not smart. And also keep in mind, many of the, the people in Maroon communities, including perhaps Queen Nanny, had come from parts of Africa that had already been at war. They were fighting the Belgians, they were fighting the Portuguese, they were fighting the Dutch. And so these weren't inexperienced warriors. Even if we talk about, say, the Haitian Revolution, there's a weird subtext that these people woke up one day and decided that they were going to fight. No, they were always fighting. It was a question of when and where they would be able to effectively fight sometimes, being able to access weapons, things like that. This is especially true um, in the US. I know we tend to tell a narrative like the US had very few slave revolts. Actually, there were a couple hundred documented ones. So Queen Nanny, like everyone else during slavery, fought back. The Maroons fought back. Slavery was never passively accepted. Sorry, I have an entire soapbox about this. <laughs> you know, do you see the shirt I'm wearing? I will listen to that all day. Uh, I want to talk about Rani Velu Natier. She had a this middle panel here, uh, where one of the students is asking where she got an army, and it comes. You come to find out that there were uh, no shortage of like allies for her and uh, people of color, women of color, black women, brown women uh, across the world, and especially in the US, in theory, have no shortage of allies, but there's somehow more of a resistance to the movements that we have historically started, uh, especially today by people who don't identify in the same way, even though it would suit their best interests to do so. Why does this not happen in 2019? Well, among other things, you're going to notice in the next to last panel, someone's on fire. Oh, yeah, I forgot about the setting yourself on fire part. Right. Okay. <laughs> and people, to some degree, we've been taught, and I know many of you have grown up on the version of Martin Luther King that was sort of a teddy bear. You've been taught about a very peaceful Nelson Mandela, and you don't necessarily see violent resistance as a normative thing. We want nonviolent resistance. And nonviolent resistance, not knocking it as a, as a possible solution, but nonviolent resistance is never well met. I, I know that there are people who will say Black Lives Matter protesters should have protested more like Martin Luther King. They actually are protesting exactly like Martin Luther King. They're getting exactly the same reaction he got when he was alive. So when we talk about this, this has always been the response to revolt. It's just that historically, after the revolution is over and everybody has sort of moved into the new normal, we pretend retroactively that, those, the, that these things were welcomed. Mm. She found allies because other people are perhaps a little less concerned with appearing nice and, and calm and respectable understood that this was a fight for their lives. So they fought together. Every woman in this book, every, every Amazon, every activist, every abolitionist is fighting for their lives, whether it be on a battlefield or at the ballot box. And we take a look at folks from ancient times till today. Let's look at this kind of modern day tableau that we have going on here. Uh, this is uh, a live feed of my Twitter timeline. <laughs> <laughs> and yours too, probably. Yes, yes. Uh, this, uh, you know, there's that, that saying, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. But some of these weapons, online harassment, racism, uh, transphobia, rape culture, misogyny, they seem to be prospering. <laughs> I mean, you know, the other thing about this is that the battles are never over, right? So if you go back to the, one of the first slides, the very first slide at al Karim. Yes. Okay. Are we going here? No, backwards. Boop. Backwards. Boop. Boop. Backwards. Boop. Boop. Backwards. There yeah, we go. yeah, there we are. All right. So these are middle schoolers in the very near future in theory, OK? And one of the reasons I put in here this modern conflict of I want to take off your hijab, I think you're being oppressed by it in Sharia law, yeah. is because so, we. Yeah, the, the, the young redhead here yes. is uh, concerned for the young Muslim girl here saying, uh, why isn't this like Sharia, the central law or something? Your hijab is Why oppressing you. Have to wear that thing you. Yeah. The, yeah. yeah, and and the the reason I included that was because unfortunately, 
even when we progress, we don't all progress together and we don't necessarily give up white supremacy, right? Um, my other book that's coming out in February, uh, Hood Feminism, I talk a little bit more at length about this because that one's for adults, serious adults. Um, but one of the things is that throughout history, part of the problem has been sort of this idea that what is good for one woman is good for all women and everybody has the same goals, the same needs, the same culture. I know that we like to have this weird narration in feminism that it's gender over race. And sure, but 53% of white American women just taught us that they're voting race over gender. So maybe, maybe we're having a different conversation so, uh, as, as a subtext than the one we're having out loud. And you have to look at what we think is important versus what the person who is living in that culture thinks is important. You don't know from the outside how anyone feels about a hijab. You don't know how anyone feels about, there's a, a, there was a brief moment where uh, those planes, the headdresses, the war bonnets, yeah. someone tried to say that it was misogynistic that indigenous women don't get to wear them and they have their own cultural headdresses that are for being honored that are not that. But we didn't want to hear that. We wanted to hear everyone should be able to wear a war bonnet because really the Coachella look that year oh, yeah. was, was a war bonnet was and no aesthetic. clothes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and every year since, honestly. <laughs> I yeah, wanna, I'm not really clear on why that's true. <laughs> I want to talk to you about this slide, especially this, this two pages. We have gone through at this point in the book just eons, eras of, of feminism, and eons and eras of people fighting at various levels of, of personal danger to make it so that these women can do the work that they are doing. Why was it important for you to make sure that these folks at the end of the book were given an opportunity to, to shine? I wanted to highlight to the students and, and adults who are reading it that people are still doing the work and they're doing it in a lot of communities. And even if it's not necessarily the work that you expect to see, it's not necessarily the work that would be most important to you, it doesn't mean it's not happening. It also doesn't mean you're not benefiting from it. Um, how many of you remember when they were first protesting the Keystone oil pipeline and there were all of the, well, maybe you saw, there was a lot of you know, we need this oil to get from point A to point B and these people are being ridiculous and they don't know what they're talking about. Yeah, so water protectors aren't out there just because they don't like progress. Fun fact, the Keystone Pipeline spilled and befouled, I think, three rivers? Or? At least three rivers it's at, at this least point, three rivers yeah. here recently. And the oil company kind of, well, these things happen. I guess we're going to clean up when we're sued into cleaning up. We told you, they told you specifically and explicitly what was going to happen. And as we talk about, you know, climate change and environmental damage and fun fact, we all need clean water, right? I know that there's a narrative of climate change that we're going to kill the planet. We're not. Earth will be fine. We're going <laughs> to kill us, right? And even if you're like, well, climate change isn't real, you still can't drink oil. You just can't. I've tried. I, uh, it really put me out for the better part of a week. Uh, I want to make sure that uh, folks really get in on these photographs or on these drawings of these women because something that all of them have in common is that they are fighting for intersectional equity. And that is not something that historically was always top of mind. There's a lot in this book about the suffrage movement and the women and men, uh, shout out Frederick Douglass, so, who, were, who were doing that real work on behalf of, of getting women the right to vote. And not just here in the United States, you know, we've all seen Mary Poppins. That subplot of women's suffrage that runs through Mary Poppins is very important. But lots of those women were fighting for the right to vote for a specific group of women only. That's OG, capital W, capital F, white feminism. And I cringe every election day, anywhere that it happens to be, when well-meaning white feminists hold up uh, suffragists like Susan B. Anthony as this feminist ideal. 
we have to remind people that we didn't all get the right to vote at the same time. And if it were up to a lot of those folks, you and I would still be sitting on our hands every election day. And so we want to make sure that we talk about these women during intersectional work uh, way before that was the cool thing to do. I'm so happy that you did that. Can you talk about a few of them that you decided to highlight? Um, so Charlene Carruthers, who is over here. She's over Third. here. Oh, yeah, wow. next, next, uh, top row. Between Bobby Jean right. and Serenia. Yes. Um, so Charlene works with the Black Youth Project. And you've seen Charlene a handful of times probably on, on media. And one of the things that BYP does is really focus not just on police brutality, but on the general health of communities, okay? We wanna make sure kids can go to school, we can eat. These are orgs I personally wanted to be sure to include. I wanted to talk about water protection. I wanted to talk about the fact that, um, and I'm gonna mess up her name again because I always do, but Serenia, didn't just say more women should be firefighters, but that the first responders at a crisis scene, especially if there's been an assault or some other trauma, should include women because women who are there may not be able to deal with seeing a man in that particular moment, right? A lot of things can happen in a bad, awful way that mean that even if you are a good guy, right now she can't do guys. I wanted to talk about the fact that we needed to look at people who are fighting not just for ending you know, environmental damage, but um, Malika and child sex trafficking, you know, fighting sound child sex trafficking, Naylan Pike, you know, who wants to prevent not just climate change, but pollution, Malala, who we all have seen, we've all talked about her being shot, but understand that the piece that she's fighting for also includes a right for girls to be educated, right? So when we're talking about this, we have to talk about Janet Mock trying to accurately de depict queer culture on, on TV, something we really have not been able to see before Pose. Things like that. We've seen the little snippets. Armistead Mopan, I know someone's gonna quote that, a handful of other things. But we are looking at a society that media does not necessarily accurately reflect. And what we see is what we believe. And I wanted to make sure that what they actually do was put down in print. Yeah. Because I've seen the criticisms, the disingenuous, often bizarre criticisms of a lot of these moves to create equity. Oh, you're gonna take privilege from so-and-so and it means they won't be able to do anything, right? It's like the ridiculous conversation currently happening that says, well, if we tax billionaires and there's a, a, a fake number that, oh, we wanna take 93% of their wealth. So that's completely unfair. If you take 93% of a billionaire's money, the billionaire is still worth millions, tens of millions, right? In some cases, thinking back to and Gates and a handful of others, that billionaire is still a billionaire. They're just not so close to a trillionaire, things like that. And so I wanted to make sure we had an honest depiction of what people are fighting for. Of the fact, so I wanna push over here for Alice Wong because I've, I've seen a lot of this. Alice Wong has been pushing for a long time for disability rights, for people who have a, a disability, physical or otherwise, to be able to access what they need, to be able to work and, and live in peace in their homes and their communities. That is not something for people to get so angry about, but I have seen people be completely outraged. How dare you say disabled people live? Right? Yeah. How dare you say trans people live? How dare you say black lives matter? How dare you, how dare you, how dare you? At some point, you have to look around the world and realize we're all in this together, okay? Not all of us are maybe real honest about what that means and there's certainly gonna be some fascist somewhere who is very angry at me. I know they get angry at me periodically. Um, that means you're doing something right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but if we don't all, if, if we aren't teaching kids to see everyone as human, we're just passing down the same bigotry. And then we keep thinking racism will die out and all of these isms will die out. They don't die out because they're taught. And if I can do even a tiny bit to unteach them, right, then I, I'm okay with my mark on this world. I'm okay with what we've done here. I'm certain somebody's gonna wanna ban this book. I'm gonna giggle when they do it. 
<laughs> well, I, I hope that, uh, that the folks who are uh, tweeting at you and sending you Instagram uh, posts of their children and of their classrooms, uh, really taking all of this in inspires a lot more folks to do it. And I hope folks in this room, if you're a parent or an educator, a cool aunt, perhaps a Mima, I don't know, that <laughs> you are, are taking this opportunity to, to really teach with this, this, uh, this volume because I would have loved to have had this as a kid. I want to uh, open up the floor to questions. It's an interactive opportunity here at the Chicago Humanities Festival. So if anybody has any questions, oh, right here in the front row, we've got one here as well. We've Everyone got uh, someone with a Coming around, we'll bring a mic over to you. Just be Yay, sure to speak Kevin. into the mic. Yeah, and this year off to a very, the very first one we showed, I think, yeah. was one of Kevin's. Sure. Excuse me, can you hold just one moment? Sure. Just want oh, to bring sure. a mic to you. Here he comes. Yeah. yeah. And then we'll. We'll get you amplified so the whole room can hear you. Thank you, Cameron. Thank you. Um, I, I'd like to ask about the character that's just, uh, uh, you know, there's a, a central space there. Mm -hmm. And the little girl who's right on the right there, it, it looks like she's saying something, but she's in the most amazing 21st century clothes. <laughs> and the one she's talking to What's happening there? That one I couldn't figure out. Sure. Oh, um, actually, what's happening is that we wanted the students, we want people who are reading this to feel like what it would feel if you were actually dropped right in that historical moment. And so the sound that we didn't end up putting on the page is just her being startled. Because what happens is that they land over and over again in these scenes. And sometimes it's a very calm and quiet scene. But I'm a, I'm a veteran, and there's a weird undercurrent that war is like this pretty clean thing, and I wanted to also sort of communicate quietly that it's, it's awful. It's scary. This is not a good thing. But it is something that if you were to drop in the middle of it, you might be scared, right? Because otherwise, I think, and I think my mic just did something crazy, um, otherwise, I think, unfortunately, we tend to teach kids passively that fighting, these things are fun. This is very exciting, right? And then we have to sort of unteach that. And especially, side note, one of the non y things I do, I look at a lot of, how do I want to put it, um, white nationalist recruitment material. And by that, I mean the message boards and stuff they hang out on. And there's a certain valorization of the idea of a race war, of violence, this, this sort of weird, we will revolt and take back the country from those people, right? Like the, the guys with the tiki torches marching, right? And they think terrorizing people is fun and funny. And I couldn't figure out at first exactly what was happening, how we had an entire generation of empathy-less people hanging out on these message boards. And then I realized that the closest they'd ever been to seeing violence was in a, comic movie or an old war movie. None of it was real to them. And I, I know how kids can put themselves into a scene, and I wanted to show her being afraid, being startled. I wanted to show several of the kids kind of, oh, this is maybe not as cool as I thought it was. There, there are only two that I can see, the one that's mm -hmm. right above her, who also look like a contemporary person mm -hmm. who No, there's actually, they're all in a circle around Guide, and you see Guide who is in the tunic, the, in the purple in the tunic. With the white hair. With the white hair. Guide has a sword out stopping a blow, and while she's explaining to the kids what is happening around them. Right. Yeah. And I, 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 I want to rewind here uh, to kind of set up, which I probably should have done at the beginning of the conversation, was that these, uh, these children we're all kind of arguing amongst themselves as to, uh, you know, the history of this and that and the other within like a classroom situation. And the guide kind of uh, appears, they manifest it out of their own curiosity. Guide is actually, they're taking a class with an artificial intelligence and guide decides that this conversation they are having is, I'm a sci-fi writer too, sorry. Um, <laughs> this conversation they're having is getting them nowhere and they don't know enough history to have a conversation about who did more for feminism or women's rights. So I'm going to teach you. 
and God takes them through time and space to show them. Because an important takeaway here is everybody did something, right? They didn't always do the right thing. They didn't always do it well. But the history of women's rights doesn't start at Seneca Falls. It starts, the history of women's rights starts with women. When women existed, the fight for women's rights began. Any other questions right here? Oh, right here. Oh, here. here we go. Yeah, right here in the middle. Yep. Oh, and here's coming. Yay. Here we go. Just scooching through. <laughs> so I know about the uh, history of um, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and how they dismissed and sidelined African American women were also voting, uh, working for voting rights for women. Um, and that's come to have a legacy called Divided Sisters. So I'm wondering, with, if this is really very eye-opening and exciting, what you have done, um, but where can white women fit in and kind of work with you um, for, this, for the same kinds of rights, really? Why? Well, why, I mean, I understand we have to, you have to engage, we have to engage African-American women of color, um, but how can we work together? You can, you can, at least inside the U.S. in particular, but generally, you, you can work on things like voting rights. The Voting Rights, rights Act has expired. Voter suppression is ringing through a lot of states. You can look at things like what's happening at the border, right? And not just at the border, but what ICE is doing inside the country. You can absolutely use that political power. I argue this in the second book. You can use, white women have more political power than white women think they do. White women tend to say, we should follow how black women are voting, and you absolutely should. Absolutely <laughs> yeah. should. If there's nothing else you take away today. <laughs> but, hey, we didn't put up any numbers for the Cheeto in charge. And if somebody is offended by how I describe that man, please tell Jesus, don't tell me, I don't care. <laughs> um, but it is absolutely integral to use the political power that white women have, and white women have a lot of political power. There are more white women than any other group of women in America, right? If white women were all voting for progress in mass, if you were advocating with your sisters, your neighbors, your aunts, your cousins, whoever the other white women in your life are, to vote for progress and not for oppression, we would be looking at a very different America. We'd be looking at a very different world. And that's not to say that you have to step in and take over what anyone else is doing. But you can lend your voice, you can lend your support, you can have that conversation at Thanksgiving, which I know is in a couple of weeks, with that obnoxious uncle, we all have one, <laughs> um, whoever. You can begin to push back against the idea because here's the thing, we, we have this history of white women and specifically in the suffrage movement, part of the push, for those of you who don't know, with um, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and others, Rebecca Latimer Felton and some others I talk about, they push specifically for white supremacy, right? The voting rights that they were pursuing were specifically for white women to have the vote to and to prevent black men and black people from having the vote, and not just those communities, right? We see this also when you look um, a Japanese internment and some other things, there's been a specific decision to vote based on race by white women. And I cannot emphasize this enough because every election cycle they start talking about the black vote and what black voters should do. Hilariously, black voters generally do the right thing. But there aren't enough black voters to Trump. Ha <laughs> ha. Uh, when white women vote poorly. And I, I think that is literally the conversation to be having. And it's not an, oh, the boomers are doing, because I know there's a sort of a narrative that it's only older white women. You can look around on any, again, fascist march, any of these young fascists stomping around that they call themselves the alt-right or something. That's not grandma with a torch. That's a 20-year-old who thinks it's funny. It's a 15-year-old who thinks it's hilarious. You have to start having these conversations with your kids because if you're not having these conversations with your kids, with your family, with your community, I promise you, white supremacists absolutely are. And they are having them with 14 year olds on the internet. They are in all of the forums, they're on, they're recruiting through YouTube, they're recruiting through all of the social media platforms, 
and the narrative is always, this is to protect you, this is to give you opportunity. If you don't counter that message, if you're not willing to have that conversation with each other, this is a, an, an ever rolling ball of a problem. Yeah. And if I can piggyback on that, uh, it's, it's a lot about showing up. It's mm -hmm. about showing up to community meetings. It's about showing up to uh, get out the vote letter writing or postcard writing. It's campaigns. about stopping when you see the cops surround a group of teenagers who don't appear to be doing anything and pulling out your phone. There's a video that circulated for a little bit. A white woman pulled up alongside. The cops were harassing a group of teens coming out of a store. And she pulls up and she's, you know, what are you doing? And she puts up her phone. And the cop is yelling at her. And this woman said, I'm not leaving until I'm sure they're okay. Right? Because she had seen black women doing much the same thing. None of those kids were charged. Nothing happened, right? We know in New York over Halloween, and this was not in the South, this was New York City, a group of black teens was detained and held for several hours because they were trick-or-treating in the wrong neighborhood. That was it. They didn't call their parents, nothing. One of the boys who saw them getting cuffed up had to intervene. So when we say that white women need to show up, I really literally mean use your privilege externally. Right, there's a saying, white women's tears can get black people killed and somebody's gonna get offended. And I'm gonna remind you of Emmett Till when you get offended. A woman lied about him and he died. A white woman lied, a boy died. Imagine that power being used to protect people as opposed to harm them. I've got a question mm -hmm. over here. Yeah. Thank you, by the way. Hello. I mean, we could all speculate about the reason, but why do you think more white women do not step up to the plate? Um, I mean, is it fear, is it? I mean, I'm gonna say a couple things, and again, somebody's probably gonna not care for it, but you'll be all right. It is a few things. It is that there's a cultural message that white women don't have power, right? That white women, things happen to them at the hands of white men and they have no agency and absolutely we're all underneath a white male patriarchy. But also, you have power and you don't necessarily, depending upon which white woman we're talking about, I see a lot of conversations where certain groups, and I'll, I'll lean he in here a little bit and talk about what we see happening with say, Quiverful and other religious movements now the messaging to these young white women is that their duty is to have babies for the armies of God or whatever, right? And okay, fine, you're gonna say, well, that's a friend group. But I'm gonna ask you how many times white girls are taught to be nice, to be polite, to not be disruptive, right? And point out that unfortunately, and I know we tend to think of black girls who fight, of Latina girls who fight, or there's all of these narratives, and they're not always positive, right? Racism is bad. But nobody's surprised if I cuss you out. Right? If I get into it with somebody or someone attacks me and I fight back, there's no social punishment for me in the black community. Somebody might roll their eyes or, girl, you could have handled that better or whatever. But generally speaking, black girls are raised that they're going to have to fight. We don't have an option. Right? We grow up with we're all we got. White girls are generally taught specifically and directly. And it's not a cultural norm that can't be changed. I've definitely met white girls who don't grow up this way. But there seems to be a weird subtext in middle class and above whiteness that demands that white women not rock the boat. And sometimes you have to be, there's a reason Madeleine Albright, and I know we have a lot to say about Madeleine Albright, and we should, said well-behaved women rarely make history. That's the thing, you can't be nice and be free. Maybe that comes later, that's not it now. Oh, here she said. I just want to add that I wonder the, the white privilege, what is the awareness, the level of awareness among white women? I think because white women- Because I mean, so, some people take offense to it. Yeah. Um, I think there's a misunderstanding of what privilege means. For the record, for those of you who are going to be like, white privilege isn't real. White privilege doesn't mean that your life is perfect and you never have to struggle. It just means you have to struggle a little less. It means that if a cop pulls you over, 
the worst thing that's going to happen most likely is you get a ticket, not a bullet. Okay. That being whatever ra that being the race you are is not something in the negative column. Right. And it's one of those things, and it's awkward and unfortunate and difficult conversations to have, but okay, fine, where when we're talking about privilege, we all have some measure of privilege, we all have some measure of things, but only a handful of privileges are visible, right? Being able-bodied, being skinny, being attractive, being white, right? And that's a pretty narrow range, and even the being attractive often hinges on being white. And this is not to make white people feel bad. I don't need your white guilt. I don't, I don't need you to be sad or mad or whatever at me. You know, your feelings are your feelings. You can go through whatever process you need to. But I will say that because of the way we tend to talk about privilege, right, we don't necessarily realize that white privilege can make the road smoother than it would have been if you weren't white. That doesn't mean that the road is smooth. It means that it could have been worse and it isn't because of your skin color. That's all it means, right? And it's not always going to be, I'm not saying that you're going to be rich. It's all gonna be cookies and cream. Your boss is gonna respect you. I'm never gonna say that white women aren't also oppressed. It's just, and this is not the Oppression Olympics, it's just where the oppression lands you. How many axes do you have to face? When we're talking about intersectionality, we're not just talking about how your negative, quote unquote, traits may intersect. We talk about other things, right? If you are an older white woman who was married and never had a job, and you're hearing about white privilege, and you are really facing the tightest shoestring budget because you don't have any money after the death of your husband, it can be really hard to interrogate what that means. If you are someone who has been told your whole life you have a right to go to college, you have a right to go to the college of your choice, and then you apply, and you are, that, uh, what was that girl's name, Abigail? Oh yeah, UT Abigail. Austin, yeah. Stay and that girl, Abby. yeah, she was convinced she had a right to go to the school of her choice, and that it was the brown people that got in and not that three, six adjusted. And for those of you who did the, the gifted, the talented track hustle, the AP class hustle, you know a three, six, and one extracurricular doesn't even make you stand out in high school. Right? The hustle for that, <laughs> and I have a kid who did it, that's six AP classes. That's a 4-2 adjusted, bare minimum, and really probably a 4-6 if you want a full ride. There's, you've started a charity, you've done all of these things, right? And you have done those things because somebody set you up for success. I see somebody in the back who probably had that auntie like, girl, you need these hours. <laughs> you need these volunteer hours to put on there. You need this other sport. You need to do this. You need to do that. There's a certain narrative of access and success, right? We're seeing this also in some cases with the young white boys that end up shooting people, right? They think they have a right to sex. They think they have a right to be loved. They think they have a right to, to be successful because what we've shown them in media is that that's their future. We don't really show white people struggling, even though we know that poor white people exist. We sort of position it as being something that happens in Appalachian communities, yeah. and then we slap a Patrick Swayze song over it and yeah. move Blue on color over two hours. Blue right. color problems. Right. I also think that there is a proximity to white patriarchy that a lot of white women are not simply willing to give up. Uh, there is something to be said for being married to a successful white man who takes advantage of all of those expectations and all of that privilege and saying, well, if I vote against his best interest, then that goes against my best interest. And hilariously, I'm gonna say this, for everyone who says, well, you know, the white patriarchy is appealing and it takes care of white women, it actually doesn't. That, that, that patriarchal voice that will say that, okay, well, He'll pay the bills and I can stay home with the kids. We have a narrative in our culture about trophy wives for a reason, right? We have a narrative. You, you're gonna age out of that. Right, <laughs> that bubble is like 20 years long, sweetie. Maybe, and he's gonna try and rob you blind at the end of it. Yeah. So you maybe, you might wanna vote for your best interest yeah. in the long term. There's a reason why so many women in this book fought for the financial autonomy 
of every woman because we came from a time if, if you've watched even a season of Downton Abbey, you understand that uh, the time where women were not allowed to have their own property, to be in charge of their own money, to have lines of credit, to prosper after divorce, that was less than a century ago. Well, and not only that, but if you've ever watched Chicago, you know how women responded. Oh, yeah. We Ooh. have divorce laws. The musical because, Chicago? Yes, yeah. yes. Because <laughs> we, have, we have the divorce laws we have because women figured out it was better to be a widow than a wife. So you should definitely vote for divorce laws. And, and By the and way, we're rights. not condoning. No, we're not any, condoning, any but I'm just saying. saying historically. Go to a marriage counselor, figure it out, like work through it. Right, historically, <laughs> what the patriarchy tells you is good for you and what it ends up being for them, misogyny kills. That's what I'm going to say. Yeah. So we have time for one more question. Oh, um, God. Come over we have here. so many questions. This hour flew by. Right. <laughs> Earlier in your talk, you talked about how this batch of women need one thing, this batch of women need another thing, and that all women's rights aren't exactly the same. But now we're talking about um, how do we do uh, the ones that are important, the religious women who want to have 12 kids and stay at home, which is awesome if that's what they're into. I guess I'm hearing kind of this conflict in my mind. I I'm going to say this. If we're fighting for everyone to have their basic needs met, if that's where we focus, right? Everybody's housed, everybody's got food, everybody has a right to go to, to be educated, to work, to choose what they want to do and then do it. We're already in a better position as a whole than we are currently, right? I, I talk a little bit about this in this book and more in my other one, but the other thing about this is that even as we talk about what white women can do and, and, and so forth and race and so forth, White women are being harmed by these votes, right? Reproductive rights is back on the table. It's on the chopping block. So that 53%, sure, you voted for what's in your husband's best interest or what you think is in your best interest. What about your daughters? What about your nieces, your neighbor's kids? It's not like it's just going to harm brown women. I think that was the thought process, I don't know. I've yet to have a good explanation of that, of that vote from anyone that is willing to admit they did the vote. But in execution, voting for everyone to have enough, pushing for equal, equality and equity and access can't hurt anyone, right? There are other conversations to have about what people are being empowered to do and the dangers of, of empowering the wrong kind of politician and so forth, so on. But if every woman had a right to an education to eat to a safe home, we're already on a better track, not just for this, that particular woman, but for her children, her neighbors, her community, for everything that surrounds. It would be a completely different world if we were living in one of the golden ages where we were focused on building better astro 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 astronomy towers, better schools, better hospitals, than if we were focused on having to fight for basic rights. So that's what I would say. You don't have to get into the details of what that other group is fighting for. Let's just make sure they have the ability to fight without having to worry about police brutality, hunger, homelessness, so forth, so on. I want to thank all of you for making time on this blustery Saturday uh, and for taking part in the 30th annual Chicago Humanities Festival. Uh, we're going to, your hand is going to fall off with all these book signings. Oh my gosh, let's fight for that for that right against carpal tunnel. Hand massage. <laughs> That's what I want to fight for the right. Oh, uh, we've got, uh, we've got a, a bar situation set up there. Hello, wait, wait, oh, you're so handsome back there. We're going to have uh, Mickey Kendall signing books, answering any more questions that you might have. Uh, my name's Jill Hopkins. This is Mickey Kendall. We are so appreciative of all of you. <laughs> Thank you on behalf of everyone at the Chicago Humanities Festival. And go to chicagohumanities.org for more information on, on more programs. Thank you, Cameron, for helping us out. And get your book signed, everybody.